just give the Lord praise for what he's doing around here. I thank the Lord for how good he's been to us. We just were so unworthy of what the Lord blessed us with. And after this weekend, there's a lot of things in my life that I want to give the Lord praise for. Brother Andrew, the other night, was preaching on doing everything for the glory of God. And so often in my life, I've just went through the motions. And I don't want to be like that no more. I want to start living my life according to his will and giving him praise for it. All right. He's in the midst of our storm. He's in the valley we walk through. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be there too. When you feel so all alone, he is standing next to you. He's with us now, our Lord, he's in the midst. As you travel down life's road, he is with you every day. With every step you take, he's walked ahead of you. And every night as you lay down, angels are camping all around. Amen. You'll never be alone, for he is in the midst. He's in the midst of our storm. He's in the valley we walk through. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be there too. When you feel so all alone, he is standing next to you. He's with us now, our Lord, he's in the midst. Into the prison they were thrown. Paul and Silas weren't alone. They knew their God was there, and he would see them through. Amen. So when the walls began to shake, and all their chains just fell away, they cried, Behold our God, for he is in the midst. He's in the midst of our storm. He's in the valley we walk through. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he'll be there too. When you feel so all alone, he is standing next to you. He's with us now, our Lord. us now our Lord he's in the midst Amen. I'm glad to know that no matter where I am <clears throat> that the Lord is always there amen and you can trust him no matter where you are grab your Bibles turn the book of 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 we'll be there briefly uh, and I want to try to kind of set us up to go further into this study <clears throat> and just make a good biblical doctrine and truth uh, make that known before we move forward but like I said last Sunday night and I know many of you have already uh, reached out to me and uh, made it known to me that you're looking forward to getting further into this study, and I do want you to know that I appreciate that. That's a big deal to me, and I want, I want to be a blessing. I want to help. Uh, I want to help with this study. I'm, I, I hope nobody thinks, why well, Brother Caleb's just trying to, you know, some kind of malintent of some sort. I hope that nobody thinks that. Um, 
My desire is to know what the Bible says, who it's, who it's speaking to, what it's dealing with, and how we're supposed to apply that and move forward with that. Amen? And uh, last week I let everybody know we're going to be dealing with cessationism versus continuationism. And defined those two terms last week and discovered that uh, continuationism is the idea that the sign gifts that were exhibited there in Acts chapter 2 um, and were mentioned in Mark 16, it's the belief that those gifts are still available and can be experienced in this day that we live and will continue on throughout this church dispensation, whereas a cessationist believes that they were temporary gifts uh, that were described there in the New Testament. Um, however, the Holy Spirit is still alive and well, and God is still able to do miracles. He just has chosen not to, uh, not to empower men with those abilities at this point. And so I uh, made it known that here at Grace Baptist, our doctrine that we have uh, ascribed to based off of the scriptures would teach and preach that, uh, that we would be lined up with a cessationist. We also took a brief look at the charismatic movement and may do that again in the future, look a little farther, but um, saw kind of where the charismatic movement of the United States of America started which is, of course, there in uh, those revivals, specifically the Azusa revival, and gave four major points of the charismatic movement or the continuationists uh, that they like to bring up when discussing uh, why they are the way that they are. And we dealt with those. They claim the New Testament doesn't say the gifts won't go away, won't cease. And the fact of the matter is, is it doesn't say that they're going to continue for sure. Now, I believe, and we'll get into that, that it does show that they would cease. But, uh, but regardless, if their argument is that it didn't, well, it didn't say that they would continue for sure. They claim that uh, obscure passages, specifically 1 Corinthians 13, 10, means that uh, these gifts would continue until Christ returns. But... As I mentioned, it is never a wise decision to build a monumental doctrine of your faith off of obscure passages of the Bible. And, uh, and they, I, I, I believe and will show uh, also that the way that they are looking at 1 Corinthians 13 is inappropriate. They claim that cessationists inappropriately divide the church age into an apostolic and post-apostolic age. But the fact is, the vast majority of charismatics don't believe that there are apostles today. And those that don't believe that there are apostles today are correct. Amen? Because there are not apostles today. Um, there, was a, there are specific criterias for what it was to be an apostle that nobody can meet. It's impossible to meet the criteria to be an apostle. And so uh, most of them, if they would be honest, would also separate the church age into an apostolic and post-apostolic age. And then they like to pull out that five, um, 500 million profess experiences. And therefore, it must be true. And that's what I want to segue into today's message, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to segue into this idea of, well, Brother Caleb, what, what am I supposed to do with my experience? Brother Caleb, what am I supposed to do with so-and-so's experience? What if you was to experience a sign gift? Or what if you was to experience witnessing someone exhibit these gifts? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You know the book of the books of, of the Corinthians, the, the letters to the Corinthians, those two books, those two epistles, are dealing with a very carnal church. 
a very carnal church. Uh, it's always baffled me that modern churches would call themselves Corinth. You know, there's a Corinth Baptist church over where I'm from, and I'm just like, I wouldn't want to be called that. Amen. They had serious problems, serious problems. And one of their problems was is they were easily swayed into believing things based off of their experiences. Okay? Now, y'all listen. It's church time. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, notice what Paul says in verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is using a picture here to describe the church. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was uh, essentially saying my job, my duty, my desire is to uh, present you to the Lord Jesus as a chaste virgin. He said, but I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We see the picture, a father of a bride preparing, protecting, and preaching to the bride for the sake of the groom. But then we just seen a problem, and the problem is the fear of unfaithfulness to the fiancé because of Satan's tactics. How many of y'all today are aware that the devil's got some tactics? In the book, in this same book in chapter 2, he deals with some of these tactics there in verse 10. He says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul's talking about bitterness there between brethren. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. He says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them uh, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. There he's talking about the blinding of unbelievers in an attempt to prevent them from getting saved. And then here in chapter 11, verse 3, he's talking about Satan's tactic of corrupting the minds of believers. Verse 4, for if he that cometh, notice, for if he that cometh preacheth any other, or excuse me, another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul's worried about their steadfastness, their solid faith. Paul's worried that somebody come along and sweep them off their feet with subtlety, just like he said the devil did with Eve, and convince them to believe or receive something that is not of God and His Word. Verse, verse 5, For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been... Truly made manifest among you in all things. Paul here for the next stretch of scripture uh, essentially defends his case. He essentially just tells them, you know, guys, I, I'm, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not your enemy. I'm not trying to take advantage of you. I love you. Because there was some rumors and some spreading of rumors that was trying to make Paul out to be the bad guy. Look what he says in verse 13. For such, we'll back up to verse 12. But, I, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. That wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And he says this, and no marvel, in other words, don't be surprised, don't act like you're shocked, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 
And you know, many of us sitting here today know that verse and will quote that verse and say, you know, you got you to gotta be sure that the devil's not deceiving you into thinking something's good that's wrong because the devil has that capability. Amen? But we don't really have recognition of the next verse, verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers... The devil has ministers. And these ministers here that are mentioned are not Satanists. They're not quote-unquote ministers of the Satanic church. Notice. It is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. In other words, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying there are false apostles. These are people who convince others, some even being the church, that they are ministers, and even the Bible uses the words apostles of Christ. And they transform themselves. I want you to realize something. Satan is the ultimate copycat. Satan is the ultimate copycat. That is the tactic of deceiving the elect. That is the tactic of deceiving those who believe. Satan has a trinity. Satan has a trinity. We believe in the trinity of God, do we not? With the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Satan's got a trinity. That trinity will be revealed during those last days. It will be Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. A trinity, a a, a three-person team to try and deceive the world into trusting in his plan. Not only does Satan have a trinity, but apparently Satan has ministers. And these ministers, again... (laughs) <laughs> they're not they, they don't look like a minister of Satan. They don't sound like a minister of Satan. They don't uh, uh, come across as having a malintent, if you will. But the Bible says that that's because they transform themselves. This word transformed uh, uh, is speaking of a disguise or a masquerade. In other words, they know how to manipulate their appearance, their perception. They know how to manipulate that in the, uh, in, for the purpose of deceiving people into believing in what they say and, and ascribing who they're doing, what they're doing, uh, what they're doing, ascribing that to the Lord Jesus. You say, what's your point, Brother Caleb? They're not doing what they do for the Lord Jesus. They are false apostles. They claim divine authority. They claim super apostleship. They love to act. If you study this out, and I'm not going to get into all of it today for the sake of time. If you study this out, they want to paint Apostle Paul into a picture that he is a a lesser apostle and that they are greater apostles. It's that little God theory that we hear so often times in that charismatic movement. They are clever orators speaking mesmerizing words. And you will find... You will find over and over and over again in this realm that they are Bible correctors. Why, Brother Caleb? Because they think that their words are coming directly from God and so they can pick and choose what is to be understood as God's word and what isn't. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Chapter 4, verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 
You ever hear anybody correct the scriptures, mark them. Mark them. Mark them. If you ever see anybody take a pen and put an X through a verse of scripture, mark them. You say, what are you talking about? Well, last week I gave a name. I'll give you another one. Stephen Furtick. Who brought someone up to his platform. Took a King James Bible. And started marking verses out with an X that he said shouldn't be in there. Because he said it wasn't in the NIV. Are you surprised they took verses out of the NIV? A Catholic Bible? Are we okay? False minister. You say, you don't know him. I know enough. Took a pen and put X's on the pages of God's word and says, that's not supposed to be in there. Now, therefore, what if that same man exhibits great signs and gifts and heals people and cures them of their ailment? What if it's somebody I knew, Brother Caleb, their whole life, and they were crippled or blind or deaf, and they were healed of that? Let me just tell you something. Even the devil transforms himself into an angel of light. You know, there's coming a day where everybody's going to stay in judgment, and the Bible says there will be people tell God, we did many great wonders in your sight, and cast out devils. And he's going to look at them and say, I never knew you. What are you saying? I'm saying miracles and signs and wonders is not what this thing's about. And apparently there's going to be people exhibit signs that God don't even know when this thing's over. We okay? You know, the Bible tells us a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. So, Brother Caleb, but what if my, I, I, I see it for myself? Or what if you see it, Brother Caleb? I have an obligation. If I witness something or someone in any capacity that wants to ascribe their actions to light and good, but contradict what the Bible teaches, I must then therefore reject it, him, her as truth, but rather a lie and a falsehood. I cannot... Trust what my senses experience over what the Bible says. And see, that's the opposite. That's the opposite of what the false teachers are saying. I shared what Andy Stanley said last week. Talked about how Andy Stanley wants to say, when the Bible and the science of our day contradict one another, he said an honest person goes with science. What is science? Science is what we can see, what we can measure, what we can experience with our person and know that that's real and that's true and that's right. That's what science, if you will in a nutshell, that's what they say that it is. In other words, they can't believe in anything unless they see it with their own eyes. And if they see it, then they have to believe in that. Well, here's the problem. I can't trust these eyes and I can't trust this body over that book. Oh, but if you saw it, I can't trust these eyes over that book. If you heard it, I can't trust these ears over that book. We are to discern the spirits. And what the scriptures tells us is that there are spirits and the devil himself who are very good at deceiving. 500 million experiences, Brother Shirley. You're going to say every one of them is not true? Yes. That's what I'm going to say. Why? Because I'm a Bible believer. Throughout the scriptures, there are only three time periods, two of which are in the Old Testament, 
where miracles have been given as an ability to mankind. Did you hear what I said? Three times that man has been empowered with the ability to do miracles. God's done miracles throughout the entirety of His Word. And I still believe in the miraculous ability of God today. We was, at, we was at the men's conference this past weekend, and there was a testimony of a man up in Ohio by the name of Jim Steely. Randy Steely, I remember we prayed for him. He passed away with cancer out of Corbin. He was a pastor. It's not been that long ago. He's got a cousin named Jim Steely. Jim Steely had test run, was told he had cancer. Went back in, saw a doctor, doctor went to testing him again, running biopsies, and the doctor said, I don't know what's happened, but I can't find no cancer. And he'd already been diagnosed. They say tests must not have been right. I have no problem believing God healed him. I have no problem believing God touched that man and healed that man. There were people praying everywhere, and our God's more than capable. He didn't need not one faith healer. And there's a reason for that. Because throughout the pages of the Bible, the specific periods of time where you find mankind being empowered with sign gifts and wonders, it had a specific reason in regards to the authenticity and viability of who God was giving it to and the purpose of which he was giving it to them for. Again, stretch of three time periods, two of which are in the Old Testament. You say, what time periods are you referencing? I'm referencing the time periods of Moses and Joshua, and I'm referencing the time periods of Elijah and Elisha. Those four men in two different time periods were blessed by God to have abilities and powers to do things that was miraculous and wonderful because God gave them the ability to do so. There is a difference in God giving a man the ability to do miracles and God doing miracles. Amen? Amen? It started with Moses. And what you find is you find the phraseology of the Old Testament used words different than the New. It didn't use the word miracle. It used sign and wonder. A sign being a signal. That's where you get sign, short for signal. It was given to mean something else. It represented a greater truth. Amen? When I put a flash on my vehicle to turn left, it's a signal that I'm turning left. I hope nobody gets mesmerized at the flashing light. Am I right? Because the flashing light's not the, not the point. The point is, this vehicle's turning left, be prepared. That's what a sign was for. It had a greater meaning and a greater importance than just the flash that everybody got to see. The word wonder, it means a special display of God's power that causes one to Wonder or be in awe. Amen. And we find these terms used in the Old Testament. Another word that you'll find is the word power, which is ability or force or might. Again, this started with Moses and Joshua. Moses and Joshua, the time span is somewhere approximately between 1445 B.C. to 1380 B.C., approximately 65 years. And these men were given specific powers and signs and wonders by God. We're going to look at some of them. If you want to go ahead and flip to the book of Exodus, I think that would be right in order. I'm going to kind of be quick. I'm just giving you some things and making things known to you. Uh, But go ahead and turn to the first part. Be in chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to give you some truth. Moses was given a handful of wonders and signs that God gave him the ability to perform that many of you are familiar with, okay? Many of you are familiar with. 
There in chapter 4 you read about Moses getting the ability to throw a rod down a stick and when that stick was thrown on the ground, what happened to it? Why it turned into a snake, amen? He was given the ability to take his hand and hide it in his bosom and when he pulled it out it was leprous and when he put it back it was healed. He was given the ability to turn water into blood. He was given the ability to put ten different plagues uh, on the people of Egypt there in the book of Exodus. He was given the ability to turn bitter water into sweet water and he was given the ability to strike a rock of which God blessed and brought forth streams of water in order to give the people of Israel drink. This is Moses. Joshua was also given ability. He was given ability to uh, the, disrupt the Jordan River for the purpose of crossing. He was given the ability to uh, destroy Jericho. He was given the ability to make the sun stand still. He was given the unique encounter with the Christophany of the Lord Jesus Christ there in Joshua chapter 5 in your King James Bible. I'm talking about miracles. I'm talking about abilities that God specifically endowed specific men to accomplish. Then we find Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha, the time span was between 860 and 795. Coincidentally, Probably not. I don't really think we serve a coincidental God. Amen. It was somewhere approximately about 65 years of time. Elijah was given the ability to shut the heavens up and cause a drought. He was given the ability to multiply flour and oil for a widow and raise that widow's son from the dead. This all in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. He, he defeated the prophets of Baal with fire coming down from heaven. What about that one? Would y'all say that was a miracle? Amen. Amen. I'm glad he didn't give me that ability. Somebody help me. Uh, God, help. We, we'd all be in trouble. Amen. Especially Brother Zach. I ain't saying, I'm just saying. Just a little, like right on the top of the head sometimes. Just a spark. Just to remind him I have that gift. If God gave it to me, I would. Y'all know that, right? So Elijah, these great signs, he brought rain at the end of the drought. He destroyed 51 soldiers with fire and lightning. <clears throat> he uh, parted the waters of Jordan. And uh, these are the gifts and the signs that Elijah did. And, and we know that Elisha did twice as many. Elijah did eight. Elisha, the scriptures recorded 16. Elisha asking God for a double portion. Not meaning he was saying, God, I want to do twice as much. That's not what a double portion is. A double portion means whatever's left from this prophet Elijah, I want twice as much as the other prophets. God always exceeds our expectations. Amen. But it, it, nevertheless, he did twice as much. He purified water. He parted waters of Jordan River. He sent bears to ravage his attackers for calling him bald. You better watch that stuff. Amen. Uh, don't be messing with Brother Zach's bald head. Hallelujah. Uh, caused a flood to save Israel and toil, or excuse me, to uh, foil the Moabites. Made miraculous flow of oil for a widow. Gave fertility to the woman of Shunem. Raised a child, the Shunammite's child from the dead. Purified poisoned cup or soup. Multiplied loaves to feed a large crowd. Healed Naaman of leprosy. Uh, Gehazi cursed with leprosy. Made an iron axe head float. Struck uh, uh, the Armenian, or Arameans blind. Prophesied the end of the Aramean siege. Prophesied the death of Benadad. Uh, the, and, and the rise of Hazael and prophesied Israel would defeat Aram. All these things Elisha and Elijah did, these miracles, in a 65 year span. So then the question is this, so brother Caleb, if God has only done this just a couple of times in the Old Testament and one time thus far in the New, why does he do it? That's the question. The question is, well, why? Why are these specific people given these 
abilities. The purpose in every instance where God empowered a man to perform signs and wonders was again to validify and confirm him as a true prophet mouthpiece for God. I told you to go to Exodus 4 and I'll show you here those of you that did do so. And Moses answered and said, Behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. In other words, Moses said, You're telling me to go down there and tell Pharaoh, Let your people go, and they are going to have no reason to do what I say, because I'm a nobody. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? He said, A rod. Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. Moses fled from before it. <laughs> Me too. The Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, take it by the tail, put forth his hand, caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee, specifically thee, Moses. In other words... God gave him this gift to prove to Israel at a vital time in the span of history that Moses was indeed God's man, God's leader for Israel, and God's mouthpiece for them. And all of these gifts that's mentioned here is for that same purpose. God chose to empower these men and endow these men with these miraculous abilities to validify, to confirm that they were indeed His men. Same thing goes for Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. That's the calling down of fire. Elijah's there. He's standing toe-to-toe with the prophets of Baal. Elijah... Uh, has them dump all that water out uh, in that time of a drought. He makes a big old spectacle. And then there in verse 36 came to pass that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day, notice, that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant. And that I have done all these things at thy word. He's praying that fire down, is he not? So Elijah says, God, I want you to do this so that they know who you are and they know that I am yours. I'm on your team and I'm doing this because you sent me to do it. And what happened? Verse 18, the fire of the Lord fell. These signs, these miracles were given to show that these prophets were indeed God's men. However, however, many Old Testament prophets, true scripture speaking and writing prophets, never perform a miracle. Jeremiah, Obadiah, Malachi, Amos, As far as we can read and tell, they never performed a miracle. But we do know this. Only prophets were given the ability to do miracles in the Old Testament. And in every instance, it was for the validating of their credentials to the people of Israel. Now listen to me, church. The people of Israel are God's chosen people. That country's meant for them. This war that's going on, as annoying as it can be to have to know that these people just hate each other, the fact remains God chose a side. And God's going to get that side. And they're going to turn back to Him. We know this to be true. The Bible tells us that the Jews seek 
after a sign. A wicked adulterous generation seeks after a sign and guess who that wicked adulterous generation is? It's the Jews. And God loves them people, don't he? God loves them people. He loves them people so much and cares for them people so much that he <laughs> appeases that desire of theirs. But you know what's funny? He's always appeased that desire for them in those specific times, those special times throughout history when the people of Israel was in need the most. They would have never left Egypt. They would have never left Egypt had Moses not showed up and showed those signs. And even after Moses did all those signs, and even after Moses, by the help of God, the blessing of God, parted the Red Sea, they get to the other side and then they started murmuring. God blessed them with sign after sign after sign and blessed these men to perform these signs in those specifically crucial times for the purpose of showing Israel this is the direction I want you to go. This man is my man. See what he's done. Know that he's mine and do what he says. And in every instance that still ended up not being sufficient for them. Signs. Wonders. So often times we think, oh, if God would just give me a sign, that would be enough. That, you know, that rich man in hell thought the same thing. Right. He's talking there to Abraham. He said, send somebody back to tell my brothers about this place because I don't want them to come here. You know what he said? He said, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe nobody sent to them. What's he talking about? The Bible. Moses, the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the prophets being the rest of the Old Testament. What are you saying? I'm saying the Word of God is what matters. I'm saying they didn't have a copy of God's Word here in this day where Moses and Elijah was doing these miracles. I'm saying that their mouth was God's Word by God's blessing. I'm telling you that God gave them His miracles and those gifts to prove that what they said was coming from God. It was always a prophet. On special occasions in redemptive history, when God chose to validate a true prophet, He did so by allowing him to work miracles. Tom Pennington quotes, making this statement. So then the question I think is this. What's the criteria for being a prophet, Brother Caleb? Well, the Bible gives us specific criteria. And I'll be done. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. You say, what's the criteria? He can't contradict what God's already said. God's not going to contradict himself. God's not going to contradict himself. These new age ideas, these changes to what God hath said, what did 2 Corinthians say? 2 Corinthians said they corrupt the scripture, the word of God. They use the Bible to deceive. If you got somebody quoting and acting like they're some kind of prophet 
and what they're saying is going to come to pass contradicts what the Bible said, guess what? They ain't no prophet. That's right. They ain't no prophet. They're liars. They're deceivers. And they're wrong. Not only Deuteronomy 13, look at Deuteronomy 18. This is the kicker. 18.21 If thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, let's just pause for a second. Anybody speaking in the name of the Lord better be saying something with some grounds. If the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. (laughs) Amen. I like that. Why? Because he ain't no prophet. He... (laughs) If a man is going to act like he knows what God says and what God's doing, he had best, look up here, he had best know what God hath said and what God's doing. It's an important note. Why? Well, here's another charismatic ideology. They've got to where they make stages of prophecy. And it's just a way of saying... Now, these lower level stages may or may not come to pass. We're not sure. And it's just absolutely foolish. It's absolutely foolish. You know, there was a man by the name of Greg Locke. They used to preach around this country quite a bit. He preached in Pulaski County, and they would bring tents out and have crusades. And this man, Greg Locke, committed some heinous acts in his marriage that led to a divorce and remarriage with his secretary and then after being ostracized from the crowd that he ran with which was independent Baptist originally he is now hooked himself directly with the charismatic movement This same man that wrote a book against Benny Hinn has now sat down with Benny Hinn and interviewed with him about how that he now agrees with Benny Hinn. A man that specifically said Donald Trump will win the 2020 election. Well, guess what? (laughs) Swing and a miss. And you can go and look and he'll have a tent up somewhere now and it's going to be full of people. He ain't no prophet. You say, how do you know? He said Donald Trump won the election. And he didn't. Y'all see where I'm going with this? For some reason... Mankind has convinced himself in his flesh and carnality that sign gifts is everything. God, I need a sign. God, I need, I, you know, show me something in miraculous. I'm not going to believe unless I see something miraculous and this and that. And the truth of the matter is, that book you hold in your hands is a big enough miracle for anything. The fact that you hold the pages of God's very word is a miracle but we want to act like that's not enough. We want to act like we need more. We want to act like, you know, we, we know better than God. And the truth is, God don't know us, I think. His gifts have a specific purpose and a specific role. Next week we'll get into the New Testament. This is very teachy. And just laying some groundwork and building up truth as we go along. But essentially, you know, 65 years with Moses and Joshua, 65 years with Elijah and Elisha. It's at 130 years of our Old Testament. Men were given sign gifts and wonders. 4,000 years of Old Testament 
Scripture. 4,000 years, 130 of them, man had these gifts. And we want to think everybody's always had gifts. God's always endowed man with these powers. And it's just not true. Next week we're going to get into the New Testament. We're going to take a look at when the gifts were given. We're going to look at the criteria. We're going to look at the purpose of it. And I'm going to tell you something. You know what you're going to find out every single time? Every single time somebody exhibited gifts. It was either a Jew or a Jew was present so that they could be shown that Gentiles got the Holy Ghost. Every single time in the Bible a Jew was either exhibiting the gift or they were there to witness the gift because they were God wanted to show them that Gentiles did indeed receive the Holy Ghost. Don't be so carnal that you need to have a sign from God. Because He don't owe you that. Search the Scriptures and let God speak to you through His Word. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I do pray that my message tonight, the lesson has made sense. I pray, Lord, that I have exhibited grace. Lord, there is a fear in me, God, of becoming belligerent, becoming prideful. And I have no desire, God. I have no desire to be prideful or belligerent. I have no desire to try to cause anybody to become angry. I merely want to take the scriptures and reveal these truths for the purpose of helping God's people, Lord, lean lean closer to the scriptures and to the spirit of God, Lord, in their life. Because that is exactly what you have instructed of us to do. As a preacher, when I stand in this pulpit, my mandate is to preach the word. To preach the word. God, men are being tempted today to get in the pulpit and tell what they think and make predictions and claim that these predictions are sanctioned by the Holy Spirit. And God, they want to, uh, Lord, act as if 